One. Got a lot going today. A lot of people doing a lot of different things. And so I'm praying from above. No. <laughs> Everyone bow your heads this morning. And let's pray. And let's get into the presence of God this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this beautiful day. This day of triumphant entry into the holy city. This day of triumph in our hearts that you reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This day of triumph that we recall and we get ready to see you again soon. Whether you call us home or we see you come amid all the clouds of heaven in your triumphant return. Above all things, we call you victorious and King and Lord and Savior and friend. And we invite you now, O King of Kings, to come and hear the praise and the worship and the calling of, the, of your people's hearts to you as Lord. Come now, Lord Jesus, into this place by your spirit. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 How Stand is everyone this beautiful Palm Sunday? Oh, we got to fix that. Everyone's got to stand up. I'm so sorry. You're going to have to, like, come on, stand up, stand up. I know, I know. Oh, gosh, she's on the mic and she's making demands. <laughs>
Good morning. Um, this this next song is uh, it's one of <coughs> it so encompasses everything that that you know we always heard if it, you know, if you could boil down the Bible, it's John three sixteen. Like everyone knows John three sixteen. What is John three sixteen? Come on, guys. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Sounds really good, but it needs a bit of a beat to it. <laughs> one, two, three, four. One, two, three. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come, all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so
just continue. First the miracle of Jesus walking out of that grave and then the miracle of us walking out of the, the tombs of our, our past and the tombs of our sins. Um, at this time, I'd like to give our tithes and our offerings. If you're listening with us online or would prefer to give online later, you can go to clintonnazarene.org or there's an app for that. You can download our app on Church Center. Our church name is CCC Nat.
You give your life to love them so alive Like you would again a hundred billion times But what measure could amount to your desire You're the one who never leaves the one behind Please be seated. We're going to be going right straight to announcements this morning, so let's go through them. There's a call to right worship our Bible study in the book of Revelation. Meets on the first and third Monday evenings, and we'll be meeting again uh, coming this first week in April. Ladies Bible study, Thursday mornings, uh, 10 a.m. They're now moving and progressing over to 2 Peter and the book of Jude uh, as they're looking at the similarities between those. So the ladies meet at Thursday with Melinda at 10 a.m. Christianity 101 is second and fourth Sundays of the month. We will not have it this Sunday because we have our Bible quizzing tournament finals coming up today. Sweet Hour Prayer with Nikki and the ladies on Monday morning at April 8th, 10.30 to 11.30 for the next session. See Nikki. VBS Council meeting meets with Melinda and the group. Uh, uh, next one will be April 21st following service. And then we're going to start getting into building everything, everybody. So it's starting to happen. So let's get excited about that. And with that said... At this time, we're going to be looking at the Bible quizzing tournament right after today's uh, service, starting at 1230. I highly encourage you to stay for this. This is only once a year, and it's a chance to really support the kids as they uh, progress towards the end of the year, all that they've learned in the first 14 chapters of the Gospel of Matthew. Really excited that the church board is progressing forward and we're moving closer and closer to being in line with the entire church of the Nazarene. And one of the most exciting things you can do is get excited about missions. And we now have a missions president. So Nikki, would you go on up there? Um, Nikki's been um, picked by all of you to be our first missions president um, and working towards that to, to bring the international and local missions and ideas to the people. She's going to talk now. Nikki, you can use one of the mics there, whatever one you'd like. Sure. Okay. All right. All right. This is sort of a preview to what else we're going to be doing in another two weeks, but we're going to start with something that Sarah brought to our attention. This little missions um, ministry, we're going to start calling it Missions Moment, and it's going to be some presentations that we that various members of our little crew of, of uh, people who have shown an interest in being uh, representative of the, the, uh, the things that we can bring forward to the, the congregation. And it will be every week, once or twice a month, we plan on doing a missions moment, and several of us will be presenting at a time, one at a time. Um, so these are things we want to emphasize close to home, around the world. We want to make sure that people are are getting excited about how much God loves other loves people just outside of the walls of our church and make an effort to minister through our giving, our our praying, just knowing what's going on. And Sarah's going to bring us something that will um, be right close to home for us to get involved in. Okay, Sarah. Did we want to play the video first? Is that possible?
good morning, church family. Just wanted to further expand on our missions minute and our missions moment and plan for our first undertaking. So as you know, our local food pantry was devastated in a fire and they are dealing with the task of rebuilding. Many of you have donated directly to them or through us and for that we are incredibly grateful and blessed. I'm sure that you also know that we run a co-op in our church on Tuesdays and we're trying to get our kids in the spirit of meeting the needs of others as Christ encourages us to do so. Um, can I have the kids that do attend our co-op to come to the front with me? Well, the kids that do come to the co-op, so Uriah, Natalia, Shyla, yep, Aria, Brady, Colt. You'll only be up for a minute, I promise. So many of our church-going kids and the faces that you see normally in the front row on Sundays attend our co-op. Um, Ella, Bela, Magnus, Aria, Shyla, Lucas, Asher, Natalia, Uriah, and uh, Aria, Brady, and Colt would love your support in this really fun and generous mission. I was just scrolling kind of mindlessly on YouTube the other day and I came across a video that you just saw and I felt like the Lord really spoke to me and what I believe I heard from him was you have a very generous church family and this would be a lot of fun. Um, so he spoke and I listened. So we'd love to do this cereal box domino activity with our homeschool group on the last Tuesday of our meeting in May. That would be May 7th. This lesson will be dual purpose. It will teach the kids about kinetic and potential energy, momentum and speed, concepts that aren't taught in public schools until about fourth or fifth grade, sometimes middle school. Um, we will then donate the cereal boxes on behalf of the homeschool group and our congregation to one of the physical locations that the open cupboard has partnered with. I believe right now there are two of them. Um, the best part is we'd love for all of you to be a part of this activity so that you can get a feel of what types of things we do in our homeschool group and what we've been up to all year. We'd love to have all of you who are available to come participate in the fun on March, uh, May 7th, that is a Tuesday. Our ask is for the next six Sundays if each adult in your family would bring in two boxes of cereal or one if two is too much, um, we would have hundreds of boxes of cereal for the, um, for the experiment and the donation. They could be any brand, any flavor. The only specific is that they have to be regular size boxes of cereal, so not a family size or not a share size. Um, if a financial don donation is an easier option for you, we would ask for about 20 to $25 per adult. Um, and we will purchase the cereal boxes on your behalf, donate whatever is left over. So we are really excited for this mission and to have the blessing of involving our entire church family, even our children. So thank you all for listening. If you have any questions, you can speak to me or Pastor or Melinda. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the other things that goes on at this time of the year is our Easter offering. And one of the things you need to be aware of is that twice a year in the Church of the Nazarene, we do gifts that go directly to our missions and our missionaries. And so what happens there is that we pay for their whole entire activity overseas. We don't make them come home and raise money. We're not like other churches. We pay for everything in the field. When they come home after 40, 50 years of service, they get a retirement plan. They get a pensions plan. So when you give during those two times of the year, that extra money is put into high-end yield CDs and all kinds of things that raise more money. So that can be used to pay for missions. So over the next two weeks, Easter and the week after, every time you give extra to that Easter offering and you label it that way, that will go directly into that program. So I want to thank, again, Nikki and the council for getting all that and bringing it forward. Did you have something else, Sarah? Yeah, so for the, the kids are going to be doing something fun for Palm Sunday in the next song. Um, so if half of the kids can please go sit next to Miss Ariana in the back, if you could wave so that she can go. Yep. And then half of the children, please go over by Miss Melinda. All of the kids in the church. Everybody. Lottie Dottie. As we say in the military. While, um, while Sue is getting ready to sing this beautiful song, I want to give you some background. Sandy pa Patty made this song famous in 88, 89 time frame. But before her, this song was actually written by a Christian rock group called Whiteheart. And in 1986, they released this song, Steve Green, another Nazarene singer with a beautiful voice. Have you ever heard Steve Green? Um, Brian Smalley and the guys over at Whiteheart. Um, they released it. <coughs> in Jackson, New Jersey in 1986, live at Six Flags, and they had this huge concert that went on for like two days. Christian rock bands back in the day when they used to do this. 
And so Whiteheart actually wrote the words to this beautiful song, but it didn't become famous because most people didn't hear it till the beautiful voice of Sandy Patty picked it up and sang it for us, Hosanna, and it's beautiful for Palm Sunday. And Sue Pascal has a beautiful voice too. So we're going to listen to her now sing to us this beautiful hymn. Well, how many people uh, enjoyed last week looking at the roadmap to the resurrection? Anybody? Awesome. I hope that's really helping you in your, uh, in your going through and understanding all that. Um, usually, I try not to bite off too many large chunks during the holidays, but I decided to go for another one, uh, which is today's message. 
And so what, I want to look, what we want to look at today is sort of a comparison between <clears throat> the triumphant entries of Jesus into our history. So as we move forward today, I've entitled this one, Jesus' Triumphant Entry and His Triumphant Return. So what I want to look at is, again, these comings of Jesus, this, and we're waiting for that second coming, and it will be very triumphant in nature, very victorious, and so various scriptures will be used. I've also tied in something that I did exactly, almost to the day, the 23rd versus the 24th of May, six years ago. Whether you know it or not, that was the first time I met all of you. Some of you have knew since, since coming to that time, but some of you are old, older folks and some of you real, real steady folks here in the Clinton area uh, in Hunterdon County, you invited me to come and speak to you on a Palm Sunday to determine whether or not you would call me to be pastor or say, no, thank you. And then at that time, I did something kind of revolutionary, I think, for a lot of people. I took all of the scriptures like I did for the, for the resurrection. I did them for Palm Sunday. I took all four Gospels, and I went through, and I put them all together, and I presented that that day as a full story of that morning, that glorious morning in Jerusalem. Now some over what? I was trying to figure this out for the kids, but it's been uh, about 1997 years ago that this actually occurred. So let's take a look now at all this stuff, uh, you know, when we look back in time, and then let's go forward. What was the reason, and here's the central question, first one this morning, what was the reason for Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem? Well, before we can actually tackle that one, we got to go back and say, what was really the reason for his triumphal entry into our history as becoming man? How about that? And I thought about this sermon, if I would have written it to its fullest extent, it would take about two hours. There's just no way you could get around it. And so I, I, I kind of focused on these two major events, but you got to look at the background. The first triumphal entry into our history was before we ever were. And, and, and the worship team did a great job with this, especially the song, So Will I, the, the, you know, that song about 100 billion you ever think about this? God triumphantly stepped into nothing, right? And created the, the light of himself reflected into nothing, and it created everything around him. And it was a glorious and triumphant six days of creation, was it not? Every day exploding in another triumph of God. Can you see it in your mind's eye? Speaking it into existence, right? Right? And what was, what's unbelievable is you got to go behind that. Before the first day, before God ever said, let there be light, he actually created us and he already knew us. And the angels already were. So there was a triumph before that. You see what's going on here? There's, there's all these triumphant events that we're going to be privy to when we get to the other side and we fully understand it all. When we will be known, we will know him as he already knows us. Who can't wait for that triumph? So I want you to think about this. Before this event, there were many, many times where God stepped into time and he triumphantly did things. The ten plagues, which is really seven plagues, in Egypt all combined into ten, that was triumphant. He set his people free. And he made it so clear to the world that he was going to be the victorious one, he triumphed over all the forces of the largest empire on earth at the time, Egypt. And on and on again. But we finally come to Palm Sunday, otherwise we'd spend another hour and a half unpackaging that. And we ask this question, what was the real reason? To state first and foremost that he has always been king and lord of everything, whether we ever recognize it or not. Amen? Do you remember what happened when he came down the road when you read the story? That the Pharisees and the Sadducees got out there and said, stop, stop, stop. Don't let these people declare falsehood and declare you God when you're not. You're creating blasphemy. Remember what he said? I tell you, if everyone here was silent, the very stones under my feet 
would cry out, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? They would triumphantly do it if we didn't do it. And this morning, the children kind of remind us of that joy we should be having every day when we get up. It should be a triumphant day to celebrate what? God and life and the opportunity to tell somebody about his triumphant soon coming again, which is just now right around the corner. For thousands of years, it's been waited, but now we're this close. And so what was the reason? To save you and to save me. To save creation. To give an opportunity for it all to be redone. And in order to do that, he had to get rid of sin. And the penalty that went with it, death. Right? That's the reason he came. And on that morning, he did it. And he did it very triumphantly. And so we can answer this question very succinctly and with this. Jesus freed us from sin and death. He saved us. He sanctified us. He set us free by his triumphant sacrifice and unbelievable victory on the cross. Amen? Everybody see that? So that was the greatest triumph of all, saving you and saving me. How many people are thankful for that this morning? So when we move on in this and we take a look now at the Scripture, let's take a look at this combined four Gospels that some of you heard back then. Okay? Went a little too far already. Back up. I'm going to read it to you. This is all four Gospels combined. Now when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethpage and to Bethany, At the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, I'll stop right there. I want you to remember where this started, the Mount of Olives. Can you remember that with me? How many people like green olives? Just a couple of us. How many like the black ones? How many like them both? Okay. When uh, when Phyllis Mason is with us, she always gets these really fancy Greek ones. I can't remember the name of them, but those are my absolute favorite. I don't know what they are. They're purple and black, and they're like this awesome olive. Mount of Olives. It's so important in the history that's coming to us real shortly, and it was back then too. So from the Mount of Olives, he said to them, go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied up on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? You will say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way, and they found it just as he said to them. But as they were loosening that colt, the owner said to them, Why are you loosening that colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. And then they brought the colt to Jesus. And this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet long ago, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And they drew near, as they drew near, they put their clothes on the colt, and they sat Jesus upon him. And a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. And then they spread their clothes along the roadway, while others spread their palm branches on, from the trees upon the road. And then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Now, every time I hear that, you know what I think of? Jesus' triumphant entry at his birth. Who sang that song before we did? The angels. To whom? The shepherds. Can you see it in your mind's eye? Who were the first to know? The people of Israel. The lowly shepherds. And now all the people are gathered in Jerusalem, and they're all crying this out. But there it is again, another triumph that I could have spoken about for hours. Because he had to come before he could do this, right? At his birth. Remember that. Because I'm going to circle back to that one along with the Mount of Olives. 
Therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, they also bore witness. And for this reason, the people also met him because they had heard the great sign that he had done. And so the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the very stones would immediately cry out. Now as he drew near, he saw the city, and he began to weep over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in your day, the things that would make for your peace, <clears throat> but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the day shall come upon you, Jerusalem, when your enemies will build an embankment around you and surround you and close in on every side, and level you and your children within you. And they will level it to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your triumphant visitation. Because you missed it. Here's the good news. He's giving everybody more opportunities. He has for the last 2,000 years, and he's going to, through you and through I, give everybody an opportunity a little bit longer, just a little bit more, even the Jewish people, that they might see what they had missed the first time. Now, what was Jesus planning to do next? He was planning to ascend back to his Father and send the Holy Spirit as a witness to these things. And so now we see this triumphant entry back into heaven. Amen? And it was. I mean, I, I thought about this a lot. Watching him come up off the ground and then become so large he fills the sky. And remember what they said? We're about to read it. In the same way you saw him go, he shall one day return. One day return. A little longer than General MacArthur to the Philippines. If you're not familiar with history, that, that, that took about four years. This one's taken a little over 2,000. But we have this idea, I shall return for you. I will not leave you orphan. And so we, we see this moment, okay? So let's, let's take a look at that. What does Luke tell us about that, that, that ascension? Luke records, therefore, when the disciples had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Will you at this time wipe out the Romans? Will you at this time wipe out all those evil people and put us in charge with your kingdom? And it, will, it, will it all be great? And will it, will it just all end and be good? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put into his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, that's what we are this morning, in all of Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in all of Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth, even in Clinton and Hunterdon County, New Jersey. Now, when he had spoken these things, when they watched, he was taken up with a cloud and received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly into heaven as they went up, behold, two men stood in white apparel, saying, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go up into heaven. This triumphant entry, triumphant return. You ever notice this? Everything about God is a descend and an ascend. He descended down into nothing and created everything. He descended down and he made us from the dust of the earth and he ascended us up out of the clay and breathed life into us and we ascended into life. He came down and descended from heaven as a little baby and grew up among us. He ascended and taught us. He ascended to the cross and descended into the grave. You ever think about that? How many people are getting new thoughts they never had before? And then he ascended up out with all the souls that were captive that believed behind him through the streets of Jerusalem and then up into the heavens. And now he's going to descend again and come back for us and we're going to ascend to him. And that'll be the last one. How many of you can't wait for the last ascension? Because it'll be us too, amen? And they returned 
from Jerusalem to the mount called Olives. There it is again. Where did he leave? Where did he start? Where did he come? Which is near Jerusalem, about a Sabbath day journey. All right, next question we can ask. Why is Jesus going to return to earth? Now, I'd love to pull you. I'd love to go around, take all the time on YouTube for four hours and just go. And every one of you would give me just a little slightly different slant on it. But is there an answer in the Bible that says exactly why? Let me ask you that. There are a lot of places that hint. There are a lot of places that tell you what will happen when it happens, like Revelation. There are a lot, a lot, a lot. But there's, is there any place in the Bible that says, why is Jesus returning to earth? You ready? Because we got, we've been mistreated. How many people are excited about that? How many people out there this morning want real justice? You know, I don't know what there was about writing this sermon, but as I was writing it, God was healing my heart a little bit. I don't know what just happened here. I got it off. My mouth's not in the right place. How many people have been hurting since COVID and you just haven't really, really gotten over it because what's happened to your country, what's happened to the world? How many people see that injustices just keep compiling and getting greater? And this week I was reading, and it just, it was driving me nuts, and I was getting madder and madder, and I didn't realize why I was getting, you know, why I couldn't handle this anymore. I don't know about you, but I get such consternation, such a good word, isn't it? <laughs> now they're going to let illegals have guns, but not the legals in California. Y you figure that one out. And, and then they're going to let them vote in California, because, you know, the Constitution applies to non-citizens. Is that what the Constitution reads? I think it doesn't say that. But, but I was getting madder and madder, and you know what God said? I'm just going to compound and compound and compound justice, and I'm going to let them have their injustices. I'm going to let them create more injustice. But listen to me, Scott. My justice is not of this world. And when I come, I will bring it in my train, and I will not let you or any of your people be mistreated again. And justice shall reign and truth shall reign forevermore. And the way you were raised in America will come to pass again. And everyone will be treated with, that, with no partiality. And I literally cried. I had cried. I couldn't stop myself from crying. I think I haven't had a good cry since 2019. And five years of just junk came up out of me. And he said, you just got to be patient a little longer, son. I know you. You chomp at the bit. But you got to be patient. And then he said to me, one of my minor prophets, one of, one of, they're called minor, but to me they're so great. One of them nobody ever reads. I need you to turn the page. And here I was, way over here in the New Testament, looking for answers, and I find myself going backwards in the Old Testament. It's like my mind went right to it. I didn't need to look it up on the Internet. I didn't need to look it up in a reference book. He said, Joel. Joel. Read Joel. Joel's not long. You can read it in no time. Anybody ever realize that? It's like how many chapters? I got to chapter 3, and there was the answer. There's the mistreatment. Let me read it to you. Job records these words of the Lord. For behold, in those days, the last days, at that exact time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all the nations, and I will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel. Now he's talking about specifically the Jewish people and that nation, but since Christ has called us all, we're all part of his chosen people. So it also applies to us, even though it's going to occur right in the nation of Israel. Whom they have scattered among the nations, they have also divided up my land. And here's where God gets mad about land and the sovereignty of nations. Amen? And the closing of borders. Amen? 
Because God drew a line in the sand, and you know what we've done to Israel? We've divided it up into a West Bank and a Gaza Strip and all these. And has it saved any kind of no war problem? Or has it brought more wars? Where are we now this morning with a fight right over there right now? You know what he said? I gave that land to my people and no one shall disturb it. And I will return it back to my people and nothing shall get in my way. Not nations, not treaties, not the United Nations, not anybody. They've mistreated my people. They've mistreated my land. How many times have we mistreated this earth? And we continue to do so. Dropping garbage from airplanes into the openings of leaves of trees and streams and people. Do you know what I'm talking about? You think it's a conspiracy? I I worked for the Army Air Force and everybody else. There's no chemtrails made from anything unless you make it happen. It's called an air show or something else. They are purposely trying to destroy all life on this planet so they can bring it all under slavery and submission. And it's just, just the tip of an iceberg. They have cast lots for my people. They've sold us like slaves. They have given a boy as a payment for a harlot. What do we see being uncovered in our day? What happens to the children, amen? Does that make you sick or what? And they sold a girl for a cup of wine that they drink. Indeed, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coasts of Philistia? Will you retaliate against me? If you retaliate against me swiftly and speedily, I will return your retaliation upon your own head. There's the justice coming. Because you have taken my silver, you have taken my gold, you have carried into your temples my prized possessions, Also the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem you have sold to the Greeks, the the pagans, that you may move them far from the borders and shove them off to the distance. Behold, I will raise them out of the place to which you have sold them, and I will return your retaliation upon your own head. I will sell your sons, I will sell your daughters into the hand of the people of Judah. Because one day we're going to judge the nations, amen? That's what that's talking about. And they will sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off. Proclaim this among every nation. This is what the United Nations ought to be proclaiming. Prepare for war. What do you think is coming? Can you see it? Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. For the weak shall say, there's where that phrase comes from, I am strong. In the spirit of the Lord, assemble and come all you nations and gather together all around. Cause your mighty ones to come down here. O Lord, let the nations be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. It keeps saying that. And people say, well, that's got to be Armageddon. It's not. It's not. Remember valley of Jehoshaphat. I'm just getting rolling. For there I will sit and judge the surrounding nations. I will put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. I will come, go down, for the wine press is full, and the vats overflow, for the wickedness is so great. How many people see the wickedness just compounding? Multitudes and multitudes shall come into the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord, the last day, is near in the valley of decision. The final solution. And I don't mean the Germans and the Jews. I mean Christ and all those who come against his kingdom. Amen? The final solution in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will grow dark and the stars will diminish their brightness and the Lord also will roar from Zion and he will utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth will shake but the Lord will be a shelter for his people. A shelter. And the strength of the children of Israel. Who sees that mistreatment getting turned around? Right? So we can ask another question now about this triumphant return. How does he return? See, it's got to be triumphant. Everybody's got to be able to see it. Well, how can that happen? How can CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, all those, na- how can all those clown networks, how could they possibly not 
Let us see this news. It would have to be what? So big you couldn't miss it with your own what? Eyes. So he's got to come back the same way he came, except he's not just coming back with two angels talking to some people on the ground like 500. It's going to be the whole world seeing it and every angel, trillions upon trillions. And we know what else? Every believer who's under the throne. Ruth, Abraham, Daniel, Noah, Esther, all of your loved ones who taught you faith and believed before you did and went to their graves marked with the sign of faith. How many people are excited about that? See grandma coming, grandpa coming, mom, dad. Huh? What a day that'll be, huh? What a reunion. So what does it look like? Well, let's answer that question. He descends from heaven in power and majesty. It's so triumphant you can't miss it. Revelation chapter 19. John the apostle records this. This is what I saw. I saw heaven opened, and behold, I saw a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges, and he makes war. There it is. Joel. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Right? Triumphant goes that song. It's the next verse. He had a name written on him that no one knew except himself. Did you know that of the 108 names for Jesus, we're going to get 109? And none of us have ever heard it. And it's the greatest name we've never heard yet. How many people get excited about names? And there's the wine press. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood because he trotted out the wine press of his wrath in earlier revelation. And his name is called the Word of God, the Lagos, the very mind of, the very will of, the very thought of, the very heart of God, and all of his perfect blessing and intention towards you. That's the name of Jesus according to the Gospel of John. Amen? And, in, and the armies in heaven are clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Follow him on white horses as well for battle. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword, which is the word of God, that he should strike down the nations for their disobedience. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Here comes no more mistreatment. Here comes no more injustice. Here comes not one more day of the garbage we see as it piles up. Here comes a day that shall live forever, a day of triumph and victory, and, and out of the mouth of babes comes praise and worship. Somehow they know better than we do. It'll be a great day, but what I want to remind you is, it's all for you to make it right. Amen? Amen? All right, now let's take a look at this one. What will Jesus do when he finally gets here? Well, we've kind of hinted at it, but oh wait, there's more. Zechariah, another minor prophet, records the outcome of this event. And what is that event? We get rescued. Who needs to be rescued besides me? All right, I can't do this by myself, amen? I can't even do this with all of you, amen? Amen? But I can do this with all of you and me and, and, and God and faith, amen? But I need to be rescued. How about you? I'm throwing my life preserver out. Where's the ring? Pull me in. Scotty, beam me up. I'll do what I can, Captain. But she's held together with Billy Wire now. I love those signs. All right. 1966, who remembers? Okay, all right, all right, all right. Zechariah records these words. Behold, the day of the Lord, the last day is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem, 
and the city will be taken. People keep thinking that Jerusalem's going to somehow stand up. They can, they're not going to make it either. The walls will be breached. The enemies of the earth will take it again. But there's a rescue plan as the walls are coming down. How many people are getting excited now about this story? All right? The houses will be rifled. The women, they'll be ravished. Half the city will go into captivity. This happened once. It's going to happen again. But the remnant of the people shall not be cut off. The Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that last day, his feet will stand where? On the mount of what? Now, here we go. This is where the real exciting part comes. How many people want to say they see the geography of the world changed? A channel opened up where we can all go through and all be saved, and they all get to watch, and they can't do anything, as the actual changing of the ground of Israel and the plains all change, and heaven and earth become one and the same. Who wants to see that? Boy, you guys are asleep. I mean, can you imagine having a new geography created by Christ? It's coming to a theater near you. On the Mount of Olives, he shall stand, and he shall split it in two. How many people realize the Mount of Olives is actually like almost four miles long? Can you imagine splitting that and shoving it out even further? Remember I told you he comes back other than life size? Can you imagine those two mighty feet coming down? Boom, boom. Can you imagine the triumph and the weight of his glory? Can you imagine with your mind's eye and see the mountain split and go that way, listen to me, go that way, 16 miles. And the other one go that way, 24. And a 40-mile channel opened up in the desert. And all the people escape. How many people are excited about that? People always say to me, well, I don't understand how his feet can be on two mountains at the same time. You don't know how big he is. Come on, how big is God? Anything impossible for him? You say, you're crazy, pastor. I knew it. Six years ago, we should have never called you. I got to tell you something. When I read scripture, it's like a cartoon. I see pages going, and I see things happening. Yeah. I have attention deficit disorder, in case you don't know. I have it really bad. I have OCD really bad. So when I'm down there in the dungeon, I mean my office, when I'm down there on my knees, God's like, well, watch. What? You know, remember, remember, remember the old 1936 Mickey Mouse with the black and the white? Who knows what I'm talking about? That's what it's like. <laughs> oh. And my wife yells at me, it's time for lunch. I don't even hear her. She calls down 20 minutes later. Are you going to eat with us or not? Oh. Save quick before I lose it. I wander upstairs. She goes, what's wrong with you? Uh, soup. Back to the show. Now listen, listen, listen. Half the mountain shall move to the north and half to the south. And you shall flee through my mountain valley. See, the topography just changed. For the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. Naha Azal. That's a tough word. You shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, when the walls were surrounded, just like the first Babylonian captivity. History's going to what? Repeat itself only in way larger volumes. The words of Amos come here. I put it in as a gloss. Who were among the sheepers of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the great earthquake? There's another minor prophet speaking to us this morning. How minor are these prophets? They're not very minor at all. Thus the Lord my God will, will come and all the saints with you. See that? There's all of our loved ones. There's all the angels. There's all the saints of heaven. Who can't wait for that? Here they come. 
right down into the trench. You know what it's like? It's like parting the Red Sea, except this time it's parting the land. Who sees it? Amen? There will be no light. And all the lights will diminish. The ninth plague of Israel, of, of Egypt. Who, who remembers the three days of darkness? What will cover our path? Darkness. They won't even be able to see us and we'll be in the light. Can you imagine that? Alex, can you imagine that? Because I see you looking at me and going, whoo, help me out here. Darkness for them, light for us. It's almost like they see the darkness up here and the light's underneath. And we just kind of go, waving the palm branches. Where'd they go? I thought we took the city. Killed their kids. And they carry us out into the desert, out into the wilderness. Does that sound familiar? What was the, the whole story of four books of the Bible? A journey through what? The desert into the wilderness. Who remembers? Except this time we're not exiting to a new land. We're exiting to a new world. Anybody getting excited now? What a triumphant deal, huh? All right, all right, we're just getting going. How many people thought their roast is going to burn in the oven? Yep, okay, that's great. All right. The lights will diminish. It shall be one day which is known to the Lord as neither day nor night. What was it like in the beginning when there was just the void and the darkness? There was no day and there was no... We're all the way back at the beginning. Who sees it? It's like God went around the corner, passed the book in, and went back around. Woo, here I go again. But at the evening time, it shall happen that light shall finally come. Because the tenth plague, the light comes, but the light is death for those who don't believe. And it's what? Salvation for those who leave. Who sees it? How many people in my Revelation class are starting to get in some more thoughts here? Raise your hand. All right, Good. And in that day, it shall be that living waters shall flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, that is the Dead Sea, and half of them toward the western sea, that's the Mediterranean. In both summer and winter, it shall occur, meaning it goes on forever. Water comes under the throne. Is that in the book of Revelation? At the end, water coming up out of the throne in a new heavens and a new earth? Yes or no? And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be the Lord is one, and his name is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. Right? The Shema, the greatest prayer of the people. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and strength. And the land shall be turned into a plain. Right now it's all these rocks, hills, rifts, valleys, deep ravines, desert, wasteland. It shall be turned into a plain that's lush and green, and all the gardens shall grow again. Is that found in the book of Revelation? Yes or no? What did he just do? He just recreated the garden of what? Eden. From Geba to Ramon and south of Jerusalem, this shall be the square quadrants of the land. By the way, it's the exact size Revelation records the new heavens and the new earth. Jerusalem shall be raised up and inhabited in her place because it's a new Jerusalem. From Benjamin's gate to the place of the first gate to the corner gate, from the tower of Hanal to the king's wine press. That's the ancient city. The outline is restored. God kept his promise in the days of King David. Is that cool or what? The people shall dwell in it, and they shall no longer shall there be utter destruction. Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited forever. How many people can't wait so you don't have to lock your door at night, turn on a security camera, Watch something on your phone and just go. And this shall be the plague which the Lord shall strike the people who fought against Jerusalem and his people. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. Who remembers Indiana Jones, the first one? See, if I had more time and you were all patient, I'd just throw the video clip up here of the Nazis opening up the Ark of the Covenant. Who remembers? And what does he say? 
Don't look! And they both turn. And what happens to them? They melt just like that picture. Every once in a while, Steven Spielberg gets it right. But who sees there's no more mistreatment for us? Who sees we just got rescued? Who sees God kept all of his promises? Who sees that you are his chosen people and he loves you beyond all measure? Who sees it? I want you to think about Palm Sunday in a different way from now on. I want you to think about what he was really trying to show us. It was way more than we thought. I'm almost done. Final question. How does he rescue us? I'm going to take a look now at this detailed topographical change, this new land being formed, and how we all shall pass into it. It starts like this. He descends in like manner as he ascended on the Mount of Olives. Here we go, all the way back to what I promised. His great glory and power will split that mountain in two. It will change the topography of the nation forever and will provide an escape route for his people on the earth. Time for the maps. Kill me some lights, would you? <clears throat> all right. Here we go. How many people like geography? There are a few of us crazy people. All right. Here is the city of Jerusalem on this side. It goes way over here. This is the Western Wall. Here's the Temple Mount. Here's the place where they think he was buried in the garden. Here's the Garden of Gethsemane. Here's the Mount of Olives. And here's one of the gates called the Zion Gate. Now, this is important <clears throat> because that's our escape route. The Zion Gate is our escape tunnel. It's our way out of Jerusalem. There's a secret passage under it. There's a whole bunch of secret stuff about this. But the Zion Gate is heaven and earth touching each other. What's Jesus doing when he stands on the Mount of Olives? Heaven and earth are what? Touching each other. And the king is ushering his people to Mount Zion. Who knows that's all about Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah if you read those books. Going to Mount Zion, right? All right? So watch this. He stands here, it splits. This actually goes that way, and this actually goes that way. And it comes down to this place called Naha Azal. You know what it means? Kind of the end of all things, kind of the final resting place. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? The mountains have come to the what? Their new what? Resting place. But who sees this big opening starting to happen? Because before, it's all cliffs. Do you see this? It's all topography. It's all mountains. It's jagged. You can't walk through it. you got to walk around to get up to the Mount of Olives. you got to walk around. There's no clear path. On that day, it'll be flat as a... All the mountains shall be brought down and all the valleys brought at the coming of the, of the terrible great day of the Lord. Who remembers that now? Isn't this cool stuff? All right, now watch. This is our path. I want you to understand something. It goes through here, but you won't believe what it goes over. It goes over the Muslim abomination, and I'm sure somebody will come after me for this. It goes after the Muslim abomination, how they're going to take over the world. You see this housing complex here? It means they're going to set up a new kingdom. Guess what just happened? It got flattened. Hallelujah. The Lord. True prophet. Is it Muhammad or is it Jesus? And there's a university there where they teach everybody all about the Muslim faith, and it's gone. Any false teaching shall be what? And by the way, little side note. This is the way Abraham came into Jerusalem to go to Mount Moriah, to the place called Golgotha, to sacrifice his son. Isn't that eerie? The same path. When he looked far off and saw the mountain far off, who knows what I'm talking about? And he saw far off Christ coming. And by faith he saw him who was not yet. Who knows what I'm talking about? He saw this day. 
Now, here's where it gets really exciting. Let's take a look at the detail. I love maps. That's why I'm a Lord of the Rings fanatic. All right. <clears throat> I didn't hear you, Natalie. <clears throat> All right, at least giggle. All right. Here it is. It's, it, I'm blowing this up. Everybody see it? Zion Gate. Here's the path. Through all this, destroying everything in its path that's against the Word of God. But look where we're going. Who sees the triangle? And it's not the Bermuda Triangle. Although it is a new world. It is a teleport. It is something to another realm. But who sees that at the bottom? Did you know those are three of the oldest churches in the world? Did you know that? Now, how many people remember me talking about the Magi all Christmas? What did the angel tell them in the fifth angel? Do not go back to Herod. Go home a different way. I have prepared it. Go. Right? And they got up and they followed the listening of the angels. Guess what this church is right here? The cave of the wise men, the monastery of Theodosius. It has been around since 200 A.D. It sits on this little hill surrounding this beautiful little cave. The wise men spent the first night out running Herod and his men killing the babies. And they took the back way home through the desert, this way. And that has been preserved. But what does it represent, Frank? What does it represent, Peter? It represents all the pagan people of the earth, all the Gentiles. Who would represented by that church? All of us. We were all called to Christ by the triumph of the stars, by the triumph of His Word written in the heavens before we ever heard the Word of God. Amen? Yes or no? All right. How about this one? The chapel of the shepherd's field where the angels visited the shepherds. What people does that represent? All the what? All the Jewish people, his chosen people from the beginning. They all heard the word first from the angels, triumphant. Hosanna! Hosanna, that's what this day's all about, isn't it? Hosanna in the high to the king, the Lord of lords. Amen? What about this one? Masaba. Start translating these words and see what you get. Are you ready? Jimmy? Rubish, this is just for you. He has all these questions, good questions. You know what he said? What's God going to do with those 144,000 men who never get married, never commit a sexual act with a woman, keep themselves pure before the Lord, and tell his chosen people while there's still time what they can do? And how are they going to meet him on the Mount of Olives if he splits it in two? Jimmy, here's your answer. And here is the hideaway in the desert, built to house on that day the 144,000. You know what it is? The refuge of my men. Who's getting chills down their spine? Or is it just me? Look what he's doing. What is he doing? He's calling us back to when he first came. What's he calling us to? His nativity. He's calling us back to when he came the first time to save us all when he was a baby. The first time he came as a mute lamb before the years, mute before Pontius Pilate, suffering and dying and saying nothing. This time he's kicking butt. And who was excited? I don't hear anything. I guess I must not have this message right. You just got rescued. There's no more mistreatment. Justice and mercy shall reign forever and ever. And we will be with the Lord, and He will be our God, and we will be His people, and no one will ever do anything to us again. I can't wait to live in the cave of the wise men, my favorite place on earth. I've always wanted to know. The three of them will be there, and I can ask questions. What did you really see? And you know what they'll say? Scott, we monitored your YouTube channel. And you were about 
65% right. <laughs> and here's the 35% that never entered your mind. You know what it'll be, Len, for me? Ah, oh, brain dump. How many people can't wait for the big brain dump? And we won't be cyborgs like, you know, people want to make us. We'll just know that we know. And what will, what will be left? We'll just want to praise him forever and ever. That's all I want to do. How about you? Huh? People say, well, that'll get boring. How? How will that get boring? The next time you wonder if God has a plan, he does. The next time you wonder, how long will the injustice go? Not forever. The next time you wonder, when will this finally happen? It will. And God will come, and he will wipe every tear from your eyes. Amen? Hosanna to the King of kings and Lord of lords. Please rise. Let us, the people of God, this week before Easter, rejoice that Jesus came triumphantly to save us, sanctify us, and set us free from sin and death, that we might live for him and no longer for ourselves. Amen? Let us, as his faithful people, his royal priesthood, his holy nation, witness to the hope of his coming again. That's the hope for this world. Offer it. He's coming again to straighten out all this mess. Isn't that a great hope? All right? He's coming in glory to rescue those who love him, his chosen people. Isn't that great? And finally, let us really sense the great urgency. We don't have much time left. These days are really drawing short. All the more, proclaim him all the more to everyone you meet as the coming King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's sing our final song. The Days of Elijah. City folk and their flying machines. Okay. All right. Sorry. I'm back. <laughs> All right, guys. I, I know we're tired this morning, but how could we not end on this song? I've, I feel like this has been one of my favorite songs since I was a kid. And it was probably one of my favorites because, like Pastor Scott, I had like an image in my mind. And it was always of this like big, long bearded man with like clouds all over him. Like, but he wasn't just floating down, he was like racing. You know, he's like, woo and the hair flying, and that's always what I pictured whenever we sang this song. So, um, hopefully we got a way more accurate picture now, thanks to Pastor Scott. <laughs> Let's sing this together.
wounds becoming his flesh. And these are the days of your servant David rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest. The fields are as wide in the world. So we are the laborers in your vineyard declare. children today down there, getting them ready to be kings and queens, to the king of kings and the lord of lords, the princes and princesses before us. Well, today, I've got a special sacred benediction for you. I'm going to say the first one, and I need you to respond in the yellow, please. Bow your heads. Long ago, they took palm branches, and they went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Together, let us, his people, reply, Hosanna. Hosanna. Blessed, Blessed is he who is com coming, coming again, again in the, the name of the King of Kings, of kings and Lord, Lord of Lords. Lords. All together, Hosanna, Hosanna in, in the, the highest. highest. Bow your heads. Now may the God who is coming <clears throat> and the God who is with you today by his Holy Spirit bring his Son ever to your mind and to your heart. And may the peace that passes all understanding be yours this day and forevermore in him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all of God's people said, Amen. You are dismissed for missions work. What? Glorious day.